Okay, I was thinking about opening this review with an affectionate allusion to Victoria Wood and her Ballad of Barry and Frida, or the Let's Do It song you might know it as, since I feel like I could spin that into a rather fitting parody that describes Andorra's Eurovision situation at the moment, but I don't want to do too many musical numbers in a row. Oh! Wait a second, that's exactly the situation Andorra's in! Well, that worked out nicely after all. Roll the title sequence! Hello everyone, I am Tessellating Hexagons, and today I'm going to devote roughly 20 minutes of your time to a cause that's very close to my heart. Listen, if you would, for this is the tragic tale of Andorra at Eurovision. The story of the only country to have never been in a single Eurovision Grand Final ever. Okay, there are some asterisks to that, but anyway, apologies in advance to any Andorran viewers in case I'm rubbing salt in that particular wound or, uh, perdonam per effigir in salt al equivalente lesio, if Google Translate got that one right. <laughs> anyway, my hopeless attempts at forming a sentence in Catalan by myself aside, let's take a look at the fast facts about the Pyrenean microstate. First up, their national broadcaster is RTVA, which stands, rather predictably, for Radio and Television of Andorra, or Radio e Televisio d'Andorra in its native language. I am so sorry for butchering the pronunciation there. For the six years they took part, their head of delegation was one Creo Rossel Nicolas, which took me a fair bit of digging to discover, but no hard feelings there, and they made their debut alongside the first ever semi-final in 2004, with Marta Raura's Chugarema Estimarnos, which was such a precious song. It was also how I first learned that the Catalan word estimar means to love and not, as one might guess, to estimate. Anyway, their highest placing wouldn't come until 2007 with Salve Melmon, performed by a group rather confusingly named Anonymous, which placed an enviable 12th in a field of 28 in the semi-final. Still, despite not qualifying, it remains a firm favourite for many fans, almost always guaranteed to top any list of which Andorran entry should have qualified on social media. I preferred La Mirada Interior in 2005 personally, but apparently I'm in a tiny minority in saying that. Ah oh well. Now. Where does one begin with this tragic tale? Well, the central theme to all of this is, across their six attempts from 2004 to 2009, they never once reached the top ten of their semi-final, never once competed in a Eurovision Grand Final, and thus never, ever, even had a shot at the trophy, and so finally caved in and gave up at the turn of the decade, deciding that they had more important things to spend their money on, and damn it, I miss them. Credit where it's due, though, you can't say Andorra didn't make an effort when it came to their offerings. In a way, they were rather like the Netherlands prior to the Dutch Revolution of the 2010s, insofar as every year they would send something different, in the hopes that that would be the thing it takes to get them to qualify, and never quite making the cut in spite of that. From that perspective, and especially considering the country's relatively small size, both in terms of landmass and population, it's worth applauding that they stuck with it for as many as six years in the first place. So what went wrong, then? It's not as if they ever stepped too far out of line with their selections. For that matter, literally half of their acts were chosen by national finals. How many microstates can lay claim to that? That is a huge achievement, major kudos there, Andorra. And come to think of it, I suppose that makes the circumstances surrounding their withdrawal all the more tragic. See, by 2009, RTVA's resources were beginning to wear thin, and once the 2009 contest had come and gone with no joy for Andorra's representative, the broadcaster severely considered withdrawing from the 2010 contest, but not only that, by the 2011 season, this had developed into them considering pulling out of the EBU entirely. Ultimately, negotiations with the then-director of the EBU, Ingrid Del Tenre, kept them in the union, but out of the contest due to budget restrictions. So, let's take an analytical look at their six-year history, and see if there's even a chance that they might still be with us if things had played out differently, or, better yet, what they could do to turn their luck around if they do decide to come back. Please decide to come back, Andorra, please, we miss you. I think the best place to start would be to give a general overview of their strategy in the years they spent as part of the active Eurovision family, and then work outwards from there. So, in order to do that, we need to look more critically at their approach to selecting an entry. Conveniently, their six entries are split nicely down the middle, with Jugaremas de Marnos, La Mirada Interior, and La Teve de Cisio being chosen by a national final, and Senso II, Salva Melmon, and Casanova being the results of internal selections. And to give credit where it's due, Andorra tried everything in their pursuit of a good Eurovision result. Of their national finals, they tried going big in 2004, 
they tried simplifying it in 2005, and they tried a small, straightforward affair in 2009, all of which taking place in different months of the year. Granted, it was still between January and March, but that's still standard Eurovision season, and thus they all took place in different stages of the Eurovision season. Across these national finals, and factoring in the three internal selections, they had a fair spread of genres covered as well. Simple Catalan pop, a pseudo-tribalesque anthem, a brooding ballad, pop-punk, post-ABBA disco, and indie pop. And frustratingly for the microstate, none of them got past the semi-finals. And even more frustratingly for me, they all led to wildly inconsistent results across the board! What's a man to do? Yes, irksomely, their results seem to bear no correlation whatsoever to the type of song or method by which it was chosen. In both 2005 and 6, they came 23rd in the semi-final, despite one being a national finalist and the other being internally selected. 2004, 8 and 9 saw them reach the middle of the non-qualifiers at 18th, 16th and 15th respectively, and in 2007 they set their record of 12th place, and in the biggest ever semi-final of Eurovision history. If there's a pattern to be had there, I'm afraid I really can't discern it. To RTVA's credit, though, it seems as if the only thing holding them back from continuing their participation was that omnipresent Eurovision demon that struck down so many countries, budget cuts. At this point, I'm not entirely sure how much of a true story it is, though as someone reviewing this in great detail, I suppose I really should be more certain, but there are legends of exactly what was going on behind closed doors at RTVA in 2010, prior to their decision to drop out of the contest. Granted, I've only heard one side of this story, and from a second-hand source at that, but rumour has it that, in 2010, British actor-presenter Justin Lee Collins had been lined up to represent Andorra. Well, more broadly speaking, he had been pursuing Eurovision participation in general that year as part of a documentary for Channel 5, and Andorra was one of the countries that had offered him that chance, alongside the likes of the UK, Ireland and Estonia, the latter of which changed their mind at the last minute and turned him away after an adjustment to the rules of that year's Aisty Lau, prohibiting anyone who isn't an Estonian national from taking part. He already had a song prepared under the title All I Ever Want Is You, and as far as I know, Andorra were willing to roll with it until their funding gave way and they had to withdraw from the contest that year. Alas, the internet has been horribly cagey with any details beyond that, but my research does suggest that his entry had been written by at least some of Boyzone, so there's that, I guess? For what it's worth, the song does at least sound like that was the case anyway. Having laid that out in the open, that just reinforces my point. Andorra were happily willing to try anything when it came to Eurovision until the money ran out. But then that brings us to the next major question. For all their very varied entries and even more varied results, why didn't it work? Generally speaking, it could be so easy to say, Oh, Andorra's a tiny country, so of course they were never going to qualify. But, I mean, that's dumb. Let's just be frank about it, that's dumb. Montenegro has qualified on two occasions, San Marino qualified once. True, Monaco never managed it in three attempts, but that's a discussion for another time. The point here is that size simply is not the deciding factor in how well a country does. You might also say, boo-hoo, neighbour voting! I don't know why it'd have that sort of voice, but you know. But, well, Andorra and Spain had a pretty enviable relationship going on, and for kind of obvious reasons. In fact, in all but one year of their participation, Andorra gave their 12 to Spain in the final and Spain tended to return the favour whenever they could. In fact, the only time that Andorra wasn't in Spain's top three was in the 2009 semi-final, where I don't think Spain was voting in that semi-final. So, yeah, neighbour voting isn't really a factor in this one. Or, if it is, Spain's actions cancel out any relevance to the discourse that it may have otherwise had. So, that just leaves one major avenue of consideration how the songs were received by their audience at large, and that's where things start to come apart for our Catalan-speaking cousins. For instance, the move from a national final to an internal selection for 2006 attracted a fair bit of criticism from the Andorran music scene, or, more specifically, ASMA, the Association of Andorran Musicians, for, quote, effectively blocking the public participation of Andorran artists. As a matter of fact, the population of Andorra, both at large and specifically within the music industry, have been openly critical of RTVA's approach for quite some time. In official statements, RTVA were attacked for selecting candidates that are, quote, not representative of the Andorran musical panorama, and by the 2010 season they were put on blast with a slightly more questionable derision that a lack of money should not stop the country from participating. Okay, I agree with the sentiment there, but these things do cost. You, uh, can't pay for something with no money. Would it be too naive of me to label that as the only contributing cause, though? I think most likely yes. 
After all, outside of Andorra, and perhaps outside of Catalonia as well, understandably, people are exponentially less likely to have heard RTVA's plight. They just hear the Andorran song on the Eurovision stage on the night and decide in that moment whether or not to vote for it, and more often than not, they took the latter option. The cold hard truth is that their entry in 2004 was drowned out by other songs of similar or better quality, and of too similar and too different style, depending on which way you look in the semi-final. 2005 and 2006 simply didn't resonate with a lot of people, which is a damn shame by the way because I really like them but now's not the time for that. 2008's live performance left a fair bit to be desired, and even then it was of a relatively dated genre. I admit, I can't give a quick and easy explanation as to what went wrong in 2009 specifically, but perhaps it might tie into the most prominent explanation people tend to offer for what happened in 2007 to the fan favourite entry Salve El Mon. 2007 was the year of the infamous Western Wipeout, where of the positively gargantuan semi-final, all ten qualifiers were various flavours of Eastern European, or just plain Eastern in the case of Turkey. And this was at a time where people were much less uncomfortable with casual xenophobia against the former Soviet countries, against former Yugoslavia, against the Caucasus, and so on and so on. Thus, people were perfectly content to blame Andorra's failure to qualify on that good old adage of block voting. The honest truth is simply that the 2007 semi-final was too big, and this led to skewed perceptions of its results. I really ought to make a separate video on that another time, but the Cliff Notes version of it is this. There were 28 songs competing in one show, bigger than any Eurovision final for 10 places in the final. It was really pushing the limits of how the format could work at all, and the proof that it was too big to sustain itself comes in the fact that by the 2008 contest, it had split into two semi-finals to better accommodate the competing entries. Had that been an element one year earlier, there is a high probability Andorra would have qualified after all. So that's all lovely and good, but what can we learn from what didn't work? Chiefly, three things, each its own distinct flavour of point. Firstly, and most prominently, because of how the shows are structured now, with two semi-finals and a fairer balance than ever of public and jury voting, now is the best time Andorra, or any country really, could hope to compete in the contest and achieve a fair result. Each entry is less likely to be swallowed up by its competitors because of the running order and because of how the semi-finals are drawn, and each individual country has a better shot at the final. After all, reaching the top 10 in a field of 18 is much less daunting than reaching the top 10 in a field of 28. And let's not forget, Andorra did nearly manage that once. Secondly, there's the budgeting issue. For the moment, even with the next contest at the time of recording, being held in nearby Lisbon, RTVA simply does not have the money to put together a competing package, even without one of their ambitious selection shows. As we've discovered from San Marino's case, Eurovision participation does not come cheap, and with reduced funding and what they call financial restructuring going on within the broadcaster, we can't expect them to just drop everything and come back, so I respect their decision to hold back for the moment. I'd rather they wait until they can afford to deliver the performance they deserve, instead of forcing them to struggle on a shoestring or less budget. Thirdly, and this ties in with the previous point really, RTVA have their work cut out for them in making the contest popular at home again. After failing to qualify so consistently and then dropping out, morale is going to be low in Andorra, especially after the criticisms from ASMA. Really, they need to take time to build up trust in the contest again, much like Switzerland did in 2014, what with Sabalter's roaring success bringing Switzerland back into loving the contest again, or like what the United Kingdom is currently going through, starting small, but building up year on year with a credible national final and more positive representation of the contest across all BBC platforms. Obviously, taking time to do that would require resources, namely money. Until they have the money to do that, they really shouldn't be expected to make that investment, that's fair. But when they do, that's where they need to begin. From there, they need to slowly work their way up, year on year, with credible entries that stick to what budget they have, and persist as hard as they've been wanting to for all this time. If that level of dedication shines through in their work, if they really step up like they want to, Europe and Australia will take note, guaranteed. And they'll have the results to show for it at long sweet last, and then they can just sit back and watch it snowball from there. Having said all of that, where does Andorra currently sit on my patent not pending ranking system? Well, bearing in mind the things that I've said about other countries and their approaches to the contest, it's only fair that I treat Andorra on the same system. 
Rank D. While I admire their eagerness to keep trying, a lot is left to be desired here. Real talk, it's fast approaching the 10 year anniversary of Andorra's withdrawal. I understand and appreciate that they can't just summon money out of thin air, but I really don't think RTVA are so blind as to miss the obvious expectation from the fandom that this could be the year they come back. Every year. I mean, look at Wikipedia. They're always one of the first to appear in the other countries section where they say, ooh, Andorra may come back this year, and they never do. It doesn't take a decade to restructure one's finances, seriously. Separately from that, if your own country's National Music Association is criticising your approach to music, you really should seek to incorporate their input in one way or another. That way, they're happy, and they'll share their positive experiences and enthusiasm for the project with people at large, thus spreading the vital positive energy for what might as well be free, and you get the added benefit of having genuine, bona fide professional advice from actual professional musicians, as opposed to TV executives who think they know what makes a good piece of competitive music. I'm not saying that the Andorran executives at RTVA just shut themselves in an office and go, tee hee hee, what terrible music can we pick this year, because they never picked anything bad, but if they want something that truly represents the Andorran music scene, ask the Andorran music scene. I could suggest some artists here and now, but Andorra, this is a decision you need to make on your own. You have the power. All this is to say, Yes, Andorra, you do have the resources, just not necessarily allocated in the right way at this time. Take as long as you need, but please do come back. You do have the power. After all, it was you that taught us. Ciel que vos es trubar la belleza de la vida, vesi busca dinzel teo cor a través de la mirada interior. Yes, I did have to fit that in somehow, and yes, I succeeded. Thank you, and good night. Ah, uh, but uh, I'm not going to sign off without first thanking the lovely people supporting me over on Patreon. It's those precious individuals that make these videos possible, and for as little as one dollar a month, you can join them and obtain a whole host of bonus perks, including the main attraction, the ability to view these reviews one month in advance, no strings attached. And you know what that means? If you're watching this on YouTube right now, then there are two brand new exclusive videos to watch on Patreon right now, available. No strings attached. What are they? Well, you'll just have to go and find out for yourself, but they're there. Trust me. <sighs> okay, I've plugged my piece. So on that note, I have been, and will continue to be, tessellating hexagons, and from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your time. I shall see you when next I see you. Until then. <laughs>